who is Mike Cashman? And does that give us any clues as to why he thinks the way he does on Brexit and other matters? With the channel having now 2,000 subscribers and some of these videos where it's just me talking to the camera getting up to 20,000 views or more, I thought some of you might be interested to know a bit about the person that you're listening to. Uh, many of you may not be, that's fine, go and watch something else, no problem. Uh, but if you are, then here's me. Uh, I was born north of the Tyne, within smelling distance of the North Shields Fish Quay. Uh, the North Shields Fish Quay used to be smellable for several miles around. Um, I'm one of four, my father was one of four, uh, my wife, we'll get to, was one of seven. Uh, anyway, I went to school in Newcastle, uh, studied maths at university, uh, went into teaching for a bit, uh, and then moved into IT, met the love of my life, Charlotte, uh, in 1980, uh, and very rapidly proposed to her, and we were married the following year. Um, I moved on from the jobs in IT uh, into consultancy. Uh, over the course of the 1980s and up to 1990, we had uh, four children. Uh, and by then, uh, I had so I'd moved to a consultancy company, but in fact, I then subsequently went independent. I wanted to be able to give um, clear and unbiased uh, advice, untainted by any corporate responsibilities to clients. And I was involved particularly in helping clients resolve project management issues uh, and, in fact, provided suggestions to the UK government as part of a technical committee, um, uh, uh, suggestions to the UK government as to how to better monitor uh, the um, and ensure good outcomes from projects. I'll return to that theme. I'm not saying that the government has been particularly successful in that, um, but that was my role. Now, for most of the following 25 years, I was operating as an independent. Not entirely. I had a year with a consultancy company um, before deciding that um, that didn't suit me long term. And I did spend four and a half years uh, in a middle management role, managing a varying sized team um, at the parcels division of the post office uh, leading up to year 2000. So we had to ensure that uh, half a dozen systems were year 2000 compliant. Uh, also, during that time, I studied an MBA part time at Cranfield, a very interesting experience, um, but emerged back into the world of independent consultancy uh, after, as I say, several years with the with the parcels division. Now, I want to talk about a particular sort of assignment that I took on um, because it's relevant to uh, some of the opinions that I have now, I think. Uh, so. It turned out that I was quite often called upon to resolve problems with major programmes going wrong. By programmes, uh, this is a major strategic change for an organisation, often incorporating a number of uh, related projects, um, often incorporating IT. So, for example, there was a situation where there was a government project, or a government programme rather, a um, uh, £200 million budget, 400 people working on it in 10 projects across the north of England, and no overall plan, and that was my job to sort out uh, with um, uh, other people working with me. Uh, but I was leading the replanning effort. We succeeded in that. The first phase was successful uh, until after a change of government, the whole programme was cancelled. But that's another story. Now, I didn't particularly set out uh, initially to have that sort of assignment. But having done over the course of time one or two of them, um, then I started to get called upon to do that more. And I'm going to speak a little bit about the process because uh, I think that's interesting given where we are now politically. So what would quite often happen would be that the directors of the organisation um, were concerned about progress, but we were being reassured that all was well. And I would go and talk to some of the key players uh, and they would generally be very open with me. And I was able to go back to um, managing director, senior um, managers, whoever it was, quite quickly and say, you know, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, the programme is in trouble. Um, and they would say, oh, thank heavens you've come. Uh, and uh, now you can tell us what's really going on. So strange, really, because I just talked to the people concerned. What I would quite often do is organise a workshop with all the key players. And the ground rules there were everything in the past, everything that's been said before is forgiven. Um, I was about to say all past deceptions, They're not necessarily deliberate deceptions, but perhaps uh, over optimistic forecasts or too great a readiness to believe over optimistic forecasts. So what's been said in the past is forgiven. We're starting from what we know now 
let's see if we can together agree a sensible way forward. Um, and often we were able to do that. Sometimes it was a question of more question of kind of salvage of um, uh, something had gone badly wrong. Uh, so I'll return to uh, to that theme um, anyway in talking about the current situation. Uh, the oh, um, children were growing up, uh, got married, uh, left home. Um, in my late fifties, uh, so Charlotte and I took a year, we did a year with voluntary service overseas in Ghana. Uh, very interesting experience. I came back to my consultancy career for a bit. I was now in my late fifties and I then took a job with World Vision UK in international development. It wasn't senior at all. I wasn't managing anybody, um, but it involved grant contracts and grant finance. Uh, and I had some skills that I was able to apply in that and got involved working on projects uh, that were taking place in Kenya, Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, Sierra Leone at the end of Ebola eradication and as part of recovery from Ebola, um, Nepal and other places. And an interesting observation there, while you know I felt the world of international development had some things to learn from the commercial world, I'd operated in you know commercial, government, not-for-profit, um, private sector, all manner of um, fields. Uh, so when I thought the international development world did have some things to learn, but in one area, I thought international development was actually well ahead of the private sector, and that's in terms of the rigour of looking at the outcomes that are expected from the project. Um, so, you know, I'm not claiming to have improved that at all. I just found a good level uh, of rigour there already, uh, whether one's working with, as it was then, Department for International Development, uh, Disasters Emergency Committee, European Union, uh, or whoever the donor was. Irish aid and US aid were involved as well in um, our programme in Sierra Leone. Uh, a really good level of rigour uh, of saying let's actually start from the outcome that uh, we're hoping for and work backwards from that to what activities will be needed to re uh, to get us there. And one particular experience during that time with World Vision uh, was to see the impact of the political instability uh, and the Brexit fears and um, uh, then the referendum vote on the value of the currency because from Department for International Development, for example, received grants in uh, pound sterling. Uh, and uh, people remember the way that the currency f fell dramatically uh, on the uh, announcement of the referendum result, um, but may not remember that there were events earlier that I was very um, clued into. So, for example, when Boris Johnson declared for leave, the currency did about a 2% drop uh, at that time, um, and money that I was receiving for Sierra Leone was suddenly worth 2% less. That may not sound much, but when you've got £50,000 less to work with in the field, that is significant. Now, I was dealing in his international development, um, but you know this applied to anybody with British money wherever they were working. Of course, you have to be uh, ready for currency variations, uh, but we had some extreme ones uh, triggered by Brexit as the rest of the world looked on and said, well, um, British currency is not going to be worth so much now. Uh, so that was a very interesting time. I also, during that time, uh, towards the end of that time, uh, took on a volunteer role for voluntary service overseas, training some of the young people, the cohorts of young people who are going out to volunteer uh, until that whole program effectively got uh, ended by the cuts in development aid from Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. Uh, I've uh, also been, uh, am, <laughs> sorry, I am an active Christian uh, in a number of denominations. Uh, I've been a charity trustee. Uh, I've, oh, and in connection with the um, church membership, uh, and I told you I came from the Northeast. So well before any of the um, recent political adventures, well before any of this stuff, I had spoken about, if you like, the left behind nature of the North, uh, how London does not have a perspective on the North. Uh, and I'd drawn particularly on how Jesus arrived in the far north of uh, a fairly poor country, um, in a place where people spoke with a strange regional accent. Peter was recognised as being one of Jesus's followers by dint of that accent. Uh, and if you're interested in pursuing, in looking at how I've pursued that theme at all, then 
find the video Shoals and Scrolls. It's not on this channel, um, but uh, just search for Shoals and Scrolls, or I'll try and put a link uh, on the screen here, uh, which you can follow if you want. Um, okay, uh, what else? Uh, I uh, Oh, I meant to mention my ancestry, actually. Um, uh, the um, Going through by my family tree, I'm 75% Irish, uh, mostly, most of the rest is Scottish, uh, and a little bit of English, which we can trace back to Alfred the Great, um, uh, if the records are right. Uh, and uh, some of you may say, aha, so now we know. Um, my Irish ancestors generally, uh, or a lot of them, uh, came to uh, England from Ireland in the middle of the 19th century, uh, around the time of the Irish Famine. Uh, many from south of Ireland, one from north of Ireland. So perhaps that gives you some insights as to why I ended up sharing songs on social media, parody songs, eventually ended up as Brexit's a trick, not a treat, uh, and following that, the full Brexit musical, using all the major tunes from Les Miserables, Brexit's musical trick, uh, and the book largely about 2020. I don't beg pardon, I'm talking bollocks from the Rose Garden. And following that, with the talents of John Asher, Zena Wig, Ram, Leon Berger and others, and recorded by and mixed and mastered by Ben Chambers, uh, the CD of Brexit's musical trick, uh, and indeed the CD of I Don't Beg Pardon, uh, and you can get the CDs on, uh, uh, on USB as well. Uh, plus, uh, this year, the full Sovereign Tea Package, completely empty box for £48.52, uh, but you do get the three books and the two CDs included with that. Uh, or, for the for £52.48, you get the version with the USBs. Anyway, video is not largely about that, it's just background to me and uh, clues as to the, well, perhaps some clues as to some of the opinions that I have, um, but uh, so you may judge. I need a prop for this next minute and I'm wearing it. I spoke earlier of my beloved wife Charlotte, our four wonderful children who are all now making their mark in their careers uh, and our tremendous parents together with their lovely spouses. From earlier this year, we got to having 12 grandchildren. And on Father's Day, delighted to say that the grandchildren treated it as Grandad's Day, made me this T-shirt this Grandad belongs to, and they all drew pictures. Um, uh, when I say they all drew pictures, uh, I suspect the younger ones may have had some help. But uh, lovely present. Um, and, of course, uh, family is the biggest joy of my life. Uh, so, that, I think, is me. Uh, if you have been, thank you for watching. Uh, please, of course, subscribe to the channel. Um, oh, sorry, uh, I did mean to add in the point about um, Brexit uh, and the current shenanigans. So, my consultancy experience does... <laughs> I, I won't get the chance, right? But I would love to have the opportunity to run one of my uh, all everything is forgiven uh, workshops where, and you know, in um, those in the past, I'd have managing directors, financial directors, chief medical officers, whoever they were. I'd love to run one of them now, uh, have the key players there, say everything is forgiven. What is the situation that we're in? How can we move forward? Um, but uh, that I know it's not going to happen. Never mind. Uh, if you have been, thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you would like. Thank you. I'm not going to say any more. <laughs>